Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIF Plus Plus seminar. This is our first meeting in the new academic year, and it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Alex Hernandez Garcia from uh, MILA, uh, which is Quebec Institute in Artificial Intelligence and also University of Montreal in Canada. And Alex will talk about GFlow Nets, multi fidelity active learning with GFlow Nets. Over to you. Alex, please. Thank you very much uh, for the for the introduction and especially for for this invitation. It's my, my pleasure to to have the the opportunity to to speak about our our recent work at at Mila uh, on on multi fidelity active learning. So uh, yeah, I'll I'll get it started and I hope you 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 find it interesting and please feel free to. To interrupt anytime with with questions, especially if there is something unclear, let's let's not keep on with unclear things. Um, Vitali, can you remind me what the about the time? So how how should I go with it? Uh, if you plan for about fifty minutes and leave five ten minutes for questions, it would be great. Right. However, yeah, don't worry too much if you're a li little bit overrun. Yeah, yeah, that's what's planned. So I hope uh, stick to it. All right. So first of all, let me let me mention some of the of the main collaborate collaborators for the the work I've I've going to to present. So especially uh, Nikita, who is a student who did great work uh, uh, on 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 this very project, and then uh, other collaborators like uh, Mox, Cheng Hao, Kolya, Salem, Alexandra, Emmanuel, and and Joshua Benjo himself. So. What you're gonna see, what I'm gonna talk about, is first a, a brief motivation of why, why I'm, I'm I'm working on on scientific discovery problems. Uh, what are the challenges uh, in in the application of machine learning for scientific discovery? Which is the really the motivation to to use GFlownets, and uh, which this is gonna be the the second part. Uh, so it's a generative model introduced a couple of years ago uh, at Mila. And and then I will dedicate the, the the core of the presentation to talk about multi fidelity active learning with GFlownets as a as a sampling or generative method in it. So I, I got interested in scientific discovery because because of climate change and, and global warming. Um, this is something that that has been close to to my heart for for a while, and I've I've been seeing the consequences of this uh, around the world. And yeah, I don't think this is something we uh, we need to convince many people, fortunately, anymore. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, probably one of the most pressing problems for for humanity. And and I decided I wanted to do something about it, also with with my work. And yeah, there's here this slide shows uh, probably figures a lot of people have seen from the IPCC reports of different scenarios. The takeaway here is that there's still uh, time, but the time is is right now. So this is the time to 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 act. This is what they wrote in the IPCC report. The time for action is now because there's scenarios where we can actually still mitigate and adapt to to the worst consequences of of global warming. And if one looks a bit more closely into into this uh, into these reports, we found that some of the things we can do is uh, improving uh, the energy efficiency uh, for for in our societies in general in, in industrial applications and uh, use alternative fuels such as hydrogen and all this relates to to what they call in the report uh, energy and materials efficiency and improving like the circular material flows so mitigating the climate crisis requires really a lot of a lot of efforts on different on different fields on different aspects of uh, our societies but one of the things we can do and one of the things it requires is transformational ch uh, changes in, in the energy and, and materials efficiency so why why materials for example there's some numbers here uh, you know we're scientists we like to to look at, at the numbers some people have quantified these things and just to give a uh, a brief a brief uh, note about about this so for example improving material efficiency has been estimated to to be able to reduce about 0.93 uh, gigatons of co2 equivalents this 
is to, to be put in context, you can see uh, at the bottom that the, the, the global anthropogenic emissions in 2019 was uh, about 60, right? So about 60 gigatons. So one is, is a substantial difference because there's very few things really that uh, that can have um, a, an overall big impact in, in the reduction of carbon emissions. Fuel switching has been estimated to to reduce 2.1 per year, carbon capture as well. And all these applications really have something in common. All these, sorry, all these um, points have something in common, which is uh, uh, that new materials, new materials need to be discovered for, in order to to unlock this these improvements in uh, in our efficiency. So electrocatalysts for fuel cells, hydrogen storage, industrial chemical reactions, carbon capture. All this is uh, things I, I believe you're all all familiar with. Alex, uh, could I ask about? Uh, on the, yes, on this slide, the budget from 2020 to limit warning. Um, so what's the meaning of this budget in uh, 510 gig gigatons? Right, so um, this is uh, for the estimation. So currently there's been, a, or in 2020, I think the the, the global warming since uh, pre-industrial times, which is when they start counting, was about 1.1 degrees Celsius and uh, scientists have set uh, a relatively safe limit on on 1.5 degrees mm -hmm. and and they have estimated how much how much carbon uh, equivalents how much co2 equivalents uh will uh take us to that to that threshold and this I threshold see. is what they call the budget of 100 and 180 uh, sorry of 510 mm -hmm. 180 margin. So right. they, in other words, they say if we emit this this much of of carbon, we're gonna. There's no way we're gonna uh, keep the the warming below 1.5 degrees. I see. So so this is the remaining distance uh, in the sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thank so you. every every gigaton of CO2 equivalent that we reduce will will uh, in a way will take us will buy us some time or at least a delay or yeah thanks for the question okay so I, i've been saying that this involves a scientific discovery so i want to say a few words to, to continue with the motivation about how science has been working traditional what is the traditional pipeline um so the traditional pipeline has heavily relied historically on 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 human expertise, because that's our natural way to do it. And, and it has worked very, very well in the last few centuries. But of course, it is time consuming and, and it, it takes a lot of resources. And that's why uh, sometimes there's breakthroughs due to serendipity. And other times it's due to the work of many people working hard for many years uh, that end up you know, uh, coming up with hypotheses, testing them, uh, in with real world experiments, collecting data, refining the hypothesis, etc. This is a slow, slow process, which works again in in for for many things. But with the urgency of the climate crisis, and also I haven't mentioned, but uh, pressure of, for example, uh, pandemics, uh, we've just come out of one, so we're going to need to 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 accelerate the the pace of scientific discoveries. This this paradigm, this traditional pipeline, is probably too too slow. So uh, my background is on machine learning. Um, so if we think about how how we can accelerate this with machine learning, there is there is a, a first very obvious uh, way, which is well, if, if we can replace the um, the real world experiments here on the on the right. So this might be something like it depends on the application, right? It could be a molecular dynamic simulations. It could be wet lab experiments. It could be anything you can think of. Uh, that's why I use the general term real world. We can replace this um, with a machine learning model that he's trained with the with the data that has been collected historically. So this is this is uh, relatively obvious. And if the world model is good enough, it would allow us to, to obtain at least uh, some results precise to a certain extent, faster than we would do with the, with the expensive, let's call it Oracle. 
And this this can be quite quite impactful in in certain applications. But uh, if you think about it, this will only give us linear gains. So if if the world model is as accurate, theoret you know, uh, ideally as the real world model, and is hundred times faster, well, we're gonna we're gonna accelerate. We're gonna increase the time or reduce the time. Sorry for for uh, the, the loop in by by a hundred fold, right? And this again, very impactful in many applications. But if we take problems like material discovery, drug discovery, where we have a search space that is uh, just humongous, it's like some people have said that there might be like ten to the one hundred and eighty stable materials, uh, or ten to the sixty uh, possible drug molecules. This is just too huge to tackle with this approach. Even if we increase by hundred or by thousand or by more. Uh, the the speed of our loop, we will never be able to to explore the entire the entire search space. So, can we do better than than these linear improvements? And and the answer is that potentially yes, if we improve the exploration uh, part. So here, um, if you compare with the previous slide, we have introduced another machine learning model. Uh, here in the place of, of the scientist, of course, the point is not to replace completely scientists, but to but to 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 assist uh, our work. So, if we introduce another another machine learning model, which is a, an agent that will explore the the space, then we can hope that it might be able to learn from from structure from the structure in the data produced by the by the other machine learning model, and make uh, good decisions about where to explore in the um, in the search space with the idea of building better queries uh, to either the real world or the world model, collect results much faster, etc. So that's the idea. And if this pipeline is uh, successful, of course, there's many, many points here where we need to to uh, to to make improvements in our in our in our models in our understanding etc then we could hope to have exponential gains uh in the speed with respect to the to the traditional uh no machine learning model pipeline and in this sense uh it, it is it is taking this into account where gflownet generative flow networks uh generative model was was proposed uh, and I'm gonna uh, introduce it in the in the next few slides. But before I do that, let me let me um, sketch a little bit what are the challenges, limitations, and opportunities in in this approach. In this approach of introducing a machine learning model to to explore the this vast space of uh, of materials, of drugs, etc. So first of all, as I said, it's it's very large search spaces, no. Um, so we we're gonna need a, an efficient uh, model to to search and generalize from the underlying structure that I've mentioned. And second, there is something I haven't mentioned yet, but there is that typically there is um, there's a problem of under specification of the objective function. What what do I mean by this? What I mean is that, for example, if we if we take the example of uh, of looking for for new drugs. Maybe what we want is that the, the molecule has a high binding affinity with a with a target uh, protein or, or or whatever we want to to develop a drug for, and this is this is probably the most important thing. Without that, it's not going to be helpful at all. But there's so many other things that that matter. Uh, for example, the toxicity of the of the of the new molecule. Can we manufacture easily? Is it is it cheap or is it super expensive? Does it does it rely on on you know uh, expensive technology or can be manufactured more easily and the same would go for for materials right and it is really hard to introduce all these uh, objectives into into an optimization or exploration problem of course we have multi objective methods but we can even even with multi objective methods which is something we have actually explored as well we can hope to 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 include everything that matters so at the end of the day uh, what we do in practice is proposing diverse candidates um, in the hope that at least one or some of them will will satisfy the, the requirements as we go 
down the, uh, the experimentation uh, process. In this regard, there is there is a limitation with current machine learning models, which is that uh, the be the things that that work best uh, for this um, for this exploration and search in in large spaces is uh, you know deep learning methods like reinforcement learning uh, and the traditional MCMC methods and and variants of it that are really good at optimization, but have proved um, limited to a certain extent. Uh, when it comes to mode mixing, so when it, when we want to take into account this idea of diversity, finding multiple modes of, the, of, our, of our our objective function, both uh, MCMC methods and reinforcement learning struggle because they tend to, uh, especially reinforcement learning, it tends to to stick to to a single mode, and there's things we can do like exploration, etc. But intrinsically, these methods are are uh, not well suited for for finding multiple modes of the underlying uh, objective function. So there is a need for what I would call here something like multimodal optimization, not in the sense of multiple modes of types of data, but finding multiple modes of the objective function. All right, so this really takes me now to, to the second part, which is uh, an introduction to, to this um, methods uh, called generative flow networks, GFLORNets, or GFN. I don't know how many people in the audience are familiar with this. Uh, I hope uh, this introduction will be will be helpful for, for most of you. So in a nutshell, um, and please, uh, like I said again, feel free to interrupt if, if something uh, is poorly explained or you have questions. <laughs> Um, so in a nutshell, we're going to have an objective function. I've been talking about this. We're going to call it R of X. And uh, GFLORNET is going to be a, a generative model that will sample object X in the space of uh, this calligraphic X, uh, point with the, with the mouse, according to a, to a policy, pi of X. And the idea is that if it is well-trained, it will sample proportionally to the, to the reward function. Okay. And this, of course, is is very beneficial. It is, will give us this diversity that we want. If we sample proportionally to the reward, then we're going to sample the multiple modes that we that we uh, intend to. In the case, of course, that the reward function is, is multimodal. Otherwise, by the way, this method would not be necessary if if we know that our uh, objective is uh, it has one mode, and then we can we can do. Other other methods, right? Like MCMC would work pretty well. Um, Alex, and then, yeah, could ask a brief question here. Yeah, nice picture. Uh, so you can see the this objective function R of X on 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 that big space, um, continuous space of potential objects such as say drug molecules, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, uh, and then with sampling policy, pi of x, does it play the role of a probability distribution? Yes, Pro it does. Uh-huh. I yeah. see. Yeah, yeah. So uh, pi of x is going to be a probability distribution. Uh, and then r of x, it's going to sum proportionally. With, uh, it's, it should come in, 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 in the next slides, but we can see that pi of x would be equal to r of x divided by the by the partition function z. So that would normalize the, re the reward is not a probability distribution, but pi of x is. Mm -hmm. do, you uh, assume, do you assume anything about pi of x, such as, for example, uh, the total, um, well, how, how you call it, the total mass is one, so the integral under this probability function yeah, the, the total mass of that's why uh, maybe it's an, in a, in in next slides. Mm. Um, well, uh, let me find it quickly. But uh, yeah, well, it's here. So let let me let me come to to this in a in a few slides. But yeah, the the the, the short answer to your question is uh, is that yes, pi of x is a is a probability distribution. The total mass is. Is one because it it's proportional to R of X, but it's also equal to R of X divided by a by the the total the sum of R of X, which is the the partition function set, and that makes it a that makes pi a probability distribution. 
And other than that, there's no there's no more assumptions apart from what I'm I'm going to to explain in the in the next few slides. Um, so this the, the the interesting thing about about difference now is that we're gonna and this is something that's different to for example MCMC. Uh, the sampler different can be seen as a sampler is going to be modeled. So this policy is gonna is going to be modeled by a by a deep neural network. Uh, here, so it's going to be a deep neural network parameterized by parameters theta, and then we're going to have the capabilities of of neural networks to to learn the the distribution and do uh, amortized inference. So contrary to to other methods where every sample will just um, uh, be used for for the updates now, but in in this case because we have a neural network. The, the data that we sample goes goes directly into into the into the weights into updating the weights of the of the neural network and this uh, provides us with the with amortization and potentially systematic generalization. This idea of the systematic generalization, what I mean in in this case is a bit what we what we see in this uh, toy figure on the on the right. So imagine we have this two dimensional space. Uh, this is the expression space and imagine this X, Y, Z. And we have a reward function, which has these four modes. And maybe we have we have discovered uh, three of them. We, we have sample data from, from the three of them, from the three of, of, of these modes. We have the rewards of, of this uh, data. And perhaps our our model can, because it's, it is a neural network, it has the capabilities of, of a, could be a GNN, a convolutional neural network, whatever. It might have the capabilities of saying, here, in this unknown area of the space, I need to sample with high probability. Okay, so this is the idea that uh, of uh, what I mean here by systematic generalization. So, being a bit more more specific about how this different is works. Again, we have X uh, in space X constructed through, and this is very important, a sequence of steps that make a trajectory tough. So we're gonna sample trajectory. So the objects X are decomposed in, in a sequence of steps. Right? If we think of it in, in, in discrete terms, uh, by the way, it, it works both in, in discrete and continuous spaces, but where I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on on discrete objects uh, in in this presentation, uh, so the actions are going to come from a from a from an action space A. So we're going to have trajectories as zero, as one, etc., until the end of the of the object, where S F would be equal to two x. So, for example, in this picture, uh, normally we model different as all all the all the trajectories. Uh, share a common uh, common node as zero. We call it in, in different language. We call it the the source state, and then we can make steps from S zero. We can go to S one or S two. Uh, from S one, we can only go to S three. From S two, we can go to both S three and S four. So as you see, this is forming a, a directed acyclic graph. So there's not only one trajectory that uh, leads to to every node. There can be multiple trajectories, but there is no cycles. And at the end. When a trajectory is finished, we get to to uh, to an object X, and at object X we can compute a, a reward. Alex, uh, could I ask if this uh, state space S is considered as a discrete sample from uh, the continuous space on the previous slide? The continuous. Oh yeah, this is actually so this um, this example is a continuous example, unfortunately, um, but not necessarily. So S, you know, if we're sample, for example, say crystals or molecules, okay. we could do it in a way that is, uh, you know, this is a, a design choice. It could be a continuous if we want to sample like atom positions, but one an, an alternative we have is sample sampling uh, fragments of a molecule or or uh, the composition. This is discrete, discrete spaces, and the difference between the difference between S, uh, this capital S, and X here is that we we uh, S can be intermediate objects, so objects that are not finished. Imagine a, uh, a you know a molecule that is not complete or a material that you only have sample 
uh, the composition, but you haven't specified uh, the uh, the crystalline structure, if it's a crystal or whatever. And X has to be a complete object. May mm ask -hmm. why there are no cycles? The cycles, uh, it's it's because uh, in the sampling, I mean, there's, there's several reasons for this, mathematical, otherwise it wouldn't work, but intuitively, the, I mean, the, 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 the theorems and the questions wouldn't work, but sampling, because here, the idea is that each trajectory is gonna is gonna make a sample X. If there is cycles and we assign a non-zero probability of of going backwards in the in the loop, then it could get stuck in the uh, you know it could form infinite loops in the in the sampling. And yeah, mathematically and practically, it it wouldn't it wouldn't work uh, nicely to to make the pi of X the. Uh, the the the, dis the sampling distribution wouldn't be wouldn't be valid. Okay, so it's important to guarantee that all nodes are actually different. In so there is no um, identification. Exactly. Yeah. If if S three was equal to S four, then we should we should really name them uh, the same node instead of making a mm -hmm. a distinction between them. That's right. Okay, uh, and to say if S1 and S12 are identical, then there would be a cycle, right? <laughs> exactly, then exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully this is going to be more intuitively clear with this example that I've made here uh, with, the, with the Tetris. So imagine, imagine that we have a task which is uh, uh, to put pieces of the Tetris on this board. I've made a, this white thing. It's going to be a, a very simple a toy board just to make things uh, feasible in terms of the combinatorial uh, properties of the of the game. So the idea is to put uh, pieces on the board in, in, in a particular rotation as, as long as it fits. And it, it's, a, it's a toy example I, I use for my presentations, but actually it resembles pretty well how we can design DNA sequences or molecules or materials if we construct this um, with, with fragments, for example, which is a very natural and very, very natural choice. So it's actually uh, a useful exercise. So the state space is going to be uh, all the possible arrangements of pieces as we construct the the board, and in this case, actually, if we allow, if we allow to stop, you know, there's an action space that's going to be stop. We allow to stop the trajectory any time. The state space is going to coincide with the with the object space X, but it we could set different arrangements and say, oh, they're not the the we have to put at least two pieces, and in this case, uh, it would be it would be different. And then the action space is all the possible pieces and their orientation. So this uh, L orange piece and it's 90 degrees, uh, sorry, 180 degrees uh, rotation, the blue the same, the, the square is, uh, you know, invariant to rotations 90 degrees, so the only, there's only one. And finally, there is a stop action. So we can, we can construct trajectories this way. So start from a zero, the empty board, add one, add two, uh, you know, add two pieces, and then maybe stop, and this makes a trajectory. And imagine that we set a reward function, which is uh, counting the number of, of cells in the board that are filled by a, by a piece. And then this would be the, the scores of different uh, objects, right? So I hope this is uh, clear, so I will go through it more quickly. And if we think of this reward function, we can immediately realize that there is not only one mode. There is multiple. Uh, I think this is a complete the complete set. These are these five uh, arrangements of pieces that have the maximum score of twelve of twelve. All right. So if we try this task with um, with a reinforcement learning, it's going to probably get stuck in. Uh, in one of the modes and have more problems to find the other ones. Of course, this task is very small, so we can do a few tricks and 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 make it work. But if this, imagine the board is much bigger, like the normal Tetris game, and we include more pieces, the problem actually becomes uh, combinatorially large, and and it's 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 very uh, it's far from trivial to solve. 
So I hope this has illustrated a little bit the the, the intuitions of, of different. And now I'm, I would like to give you some more uh, details of the of the mathematics behind the the GFlonet. So there is this concept uh, that we call the the trajectory flow. So this is the if we now see this this graph that I was showing before in movement, and we imagine that the transitions between states can be quantified uh by a by by a by a number by a quantity that we call state um we call it the flows and the flows are analogy uh, to um to imagine like water flowing pipes and if we normalize them then it would become a probability distribution as we discussed at the beginning with vitali um then the total flow of a trajectory it's going to be a relevant quantity and we just name it by f of f of tau right the state flow is going to be the sum of the flow going through a through state s then uh what we can visualize in in the in the gif thingy is the edge flow so how much flow goes from state s to a state uh s prime and then having these quantities in mind is the, we can we can define the um the, the quantities that are actually of most interest to us, which is this forward policy and the backward policy. So the forward policy is what will allow us to, to sample objects. And it is essentially um, the flow, the, the forward policy of state S prime given state S. So in an example, imagine S3, the forward policy of S3 given S1 is going to be the, the flow, the edge flow between, between the two states divided by the total flow of s okay so this defines a this is a prob this is a probability this is normalized and the same for backward policy if we go uh backwards we can sample backward trajectories as well there's nothing that that uh, prevents us from from doing that and it's going to become a useful quantity as well in in certain objective functions so Having known this, how can we, having seen this, how can we transform or uh, use this, these quantities, these uh, ideas and mathematical objects to define a training objective to actually train this neural network I was talking about? Um, the first uh, proposal of an objective function in the, in the original paper is based on, on an idea of a principle of conservation of the, of the flows. So if we look at the graph and we uh, set ourselves to think that the total flow going to a state, take for example, S3, let's look at, at one to, to illustrate it. The total flow going to S3, so it's the sum of all the incoming edges, so from the flow from S1 and the flow from S2. If it is conserved, it should be equal to the flow coming out of S3. S3 going to S7 and S3 going to X3. And of course, if you initialize a neural network randomly to model these transitions, this is not going to be satisfied. So we can use it to define a loss function and then uh, train with gradient descent as, you know, as usual to adjust the weights to minimize this, this loss. So more... Formally, mathematically, is what we see here. We have that the sum of the all the parents of S has to be equal. The sum of the flow of all the transitions going to to uh, to S has to be equal to the sum of the flow going to the to the children of S. We just compute the difference, square, take the log, and this becomes a, a the flow matching objective. So I give you a second to look at it think about it and if it's not clear um please let me know alex uh am i right what under the logarithm you have uh the left hand side divided by the right hand side yeah ah so so is it so you move equation is not guaranteed you are trying to guarantee it oh yeah 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 sorry yeah this this i would like to make very clear so this is not if we define the this graph like this it, it's it's not a conclusion uh, it doesn't imply that this is going to be satisfied is that we can compute this this loss so how much it is it is um how much is the 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 error 
in this in this quantity. And then we can, because we're going to parameterize the transitions with a neural network, we can minimize this loss and make it uh, and make it close to zero, in in asymptotically. Um, yeah. So this this we can use to train a neural network. So we kind of have what we want. If it is a small neural network, we're going to be able to to minimize it. Uh, uh, completely. If it's a very large space with a lot of nodes and a lot of edges, then uh, it, it is unfeasible to 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 make it exactly equal to zero. But it will it will decrease uh, enough. And you know this is a general thing in 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 neural network training. We hope that it will generalize to to the rest of the unexplored space. And this is sort of what we see in practice. If we come back to the Tetris example, we see that after training the the model as we defined it before with this uh, objective function, we see that if we compute this uh, this pi of x and you know I, I convert it into into percentages to for for me to make it intuitive, uh, we see that the probability of sampling each of these five modes is of a uh, temp about eight nine percent. Okay, so they are all the same, so it makes sense. It's it's not perfect, as you can see that they are they in you know in theory they should all be uh, equal, um, but what we see is that it works um, relatively uh, well. Um, in this small problem, it works pretty well. Do, do we expect the total sum to be one hundred percent or close to one hundred percent? The sum of the sum of all these four uh, five. Uh, Objects, no, I don't expect it to be hundred percent because there's other other states with a lower score that are also um, uh, yeah they, they also need to have a, a non-zero probability of being sampled. Okay, I see. So this is only well the top, the top exactly the the five okay. the five uh, objects that have the maximum probability, the max sorry the maximum score reward. Also, in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping a few details, but um, in order to exaggerate the, um, the probabilities, I set the reward to be, uh, you know, uh, just the, the power of the, two, the, the, the original score to the power of, of four to make these probabilities larger. This is something we can decide. We want to sample. Imagine you say, oh, I want to only assign uh, probabilities uh, that are high enough to the mode. So you, you can just take a in Boltzmann um, function or take the power of four as I did here. This is a design choice. It depends if you are interested in sample uh, objects that have, you know, good score but not the top or not. So this is a. I just made it here to to exaggerate, but it would work in in any case. Um, Okay, this slide I'm going to skip in the interest of, of time so, so I get to the multi-fidelity active learning, but it is essentially some various results from the original paper on, you know, I've shown the results on the Tetris. Here we, there are results on, on the hypergrid, on small molecules, but I'm going to show you more results of this, so I will skip it in the interest of time. Also, this slide shows how we can extend these GFLNets to do a, multi-objective um, exploration. So there's the link in the in the slide. Uh, I'll share the link to the slides later, but yeah, I will I will not get into the details in the interest of time. And same for this one. This is a uh, just to show that we we have extended uh, recently, well, about a year ago, uh, the theory that was originally proposed for for uh, discrete spaces. It was we extended it to uh, to continuous uh, spaces as well, so it works it works pretty well as well in, in continuous spaces. Okay, but for the rest of of the talk, I would like to talk uh, about uh, multifidelity active learning and how we have used this or we are using this to uh, to tackle scientific discovery problems. So, first of all, why why multifidelity? Why why we are interested in in this idea? Well, in our collaborations with uh, with chemists, with biologists, uh, material scientists, we always see that uh, it is it is common to use multiple methods, multiple models 
to characterize a material, a molecule, etc. So as you know, there's uh, you can uh, synthesize a material in the lab or use density functional theory, or maybe you have access to a large GNN that gives you some good results because it was trained on, on, on large amounts of DFT data, but maybe that graph neural network is too, um, too heavy, too large, too slow for, for some problems. For example, it would be the case for for uh, to train like a big GFLORNET. So sometimes you, you might want to have a smaller neural network. So all these make different oracles in the in the multi-fidelity Bayesian optimization and active learning language. So it is it would be great if we have the methods to actually leverage the, the availability of all these oracles. But there is a problem that actually multi-fidelity methods uh, available in the literature that are mostly Bayesian optimization methods have problems with structured, large, and high-dimensional search spaces. So Bayesian optimization has proven to work very well in continuous spaces of about up to, say, you know, 15, 20 dimensions max. And then it really starts uh, struggling. And here in in, uh, in these scientific discovery problems, we are dealing with very, very high dimensional uh, search spaces, highly structured. Think of crystals, uh, molecules, et cetera. It's not just a, a hypercube, which is a typical uh, problem used in uh, invasion optimization. So we really need to do a um, uh, structured optimization. And this is where the combination of active learning, GFRNets, and multi-fidelity methods can be combined to, to uh, give us something that, that can be useful for, for our the scientific discovery problems we are tackling. So this figure here I made uh, aims at illustrating uh, the overall algorithm. So I'm gonna take a few seconds to, to guide you through the through what is here. Because if, if this is clear, um, I'll be happy because it, it, it you know I think it, it summarizes the the algorithm and how we are um, <clears throat> attacking this this problem with GFNets. So I will start from the right actually. So this uh, the, the rightmost uh, icon of the world is our best oracle. This is the objective function we want to to optimize. And we're gonna call it F capital M. Okay, this is the this is the highest fidelity oracle. This is really what we want to to optimize and find multiple modes of. However, imagine this is a, a wet lab experiment. The, the the results of characterizing the property of a material, for example, in in the lab, very expensive. We cannot uh, query this oracle very often. So we have approximations of it. And we're gonna call them mathematically f m minus one all the way down to f one because we have multiple of them, and they become less costly but also less accurate. And the cost is gonna be these lambdas, okay? Lambda one, lambda two, up to this is a mistake. This should be capital M, lambda capital M here. And we assume that, uh, but this is without loss of generality, that the cost is smaller for uh, for lower indices. So we can form a batch of candidates here on the top uh, for which we have X, the candidate itself, and the, the index of the, uh, of the fidelity. And then we can send different candidates to different oracles uh, of different fidelity, and then collect a data set that is gonna be the triplet of X, I, so the, the, the object, the molecule, the crystal, whatever, the value of the oracle, and then the index of the oracle for which it was uh, queried, okay? And if we have a data set, then we can train a surrogate model. We can train a machine learning model that in this case is gonna be a probabilistic uh, model as, in, as is done in, in Bayesian optimization. And this surrogate model uh, gives us the posterior of our oracle of fidelity M, given these three things. the Of course, X, the object, M, the index of the fidelity, and D, which is the, the past data. 
So this is more or less standard um, multi-fidelity Bayesian optimization. However, here is where we introduced uh, GFlownet. And we do it by computing first an acquisition function. Still, this is based on optimization. So we can compute an acquisition function that will tell us uh, about the usefulness of querying um, candidate X with Oracle M. This is, uh, you're going to see in the next few slides that it's a, it's a, we use an acquisition function based on the, on the mutual information about the, about the maximum fidelity. And this is what we actually use as reward function to train a GFlownet. So GFlownet is trained by doing many calls to the surrogate, which is cheap, uh, take acquisition function and do this loop many, many times as it explores the, the space in, a, in an efficient way, and it learns to sample proportionally to the acquisition function, which is the reward. So at the end of training, when we have minimized the loss, um, and, and of course, uh, it is learning to sample proportionally to the acquisition function, we can sample mm, you know, virtually as many uh, objects as we want, let's say capital N, because sampling from different is, is very cheap. And then we can use the acquisition function to filter the, the best B candidates, okay? So we select the top B, we send them, uh, and by the way, these candidates are gonna be not only uh, the object, but also the fidelity. So this is actually one important bit of GFlownet, uh, of this multi-fidelity GFlownet, which is it samples both X and M. So I had not mentioned this before. So now we have this data set, new data set of, of candidates that we send to our oracles, get new data and repeat. We repeat this many times. And what we will be doing is acquiring uh, more and more data as suggested by, by GFlownet, which is learning to explore this uh, high dimensional large space. This makes, uh, this improves our surrogate over time, and especially, which is the objective of this algorithm, it uh, discovers can diverse candidates. So diverse candidates, that's important, with high scores. Um, let me skip this for now in the interest of time and give you a few hints about the acquisition function alpha. So as I mentioned, alpha is going to be a multi-fidelity acquisition function, which is the, the mutual information between the maximum fidelity oracle or posterior of the maximum fidelity oracle and the, uh, and the fidelity we're interested in lowercase m. And this is the by, divided by the cost to make the, the acquisition function uh, be lower if the oracle m has high cost. And then, uh, like I said before, this multi-fidelity version of GFlownet samples all uh, the, the different dimensions of object X together with the fidelity M, which is gonna be in zero, one, two, up to M in, in, the, in the graph. So just think of it as, a, as an extra dimension of, of the object X that is included in the, in the graph, in the, this direct acyclic graph. So to demonstrate how, how this works, we compare it to, uh, to several baselines. One is just a single fidelity uh, GFlownet method trained with the, just with access to the, to the highest fidelity oracle. Then with, um, with a GFlownet that would sample, it would train to sample objects X, but instead of learning to sample the fidelity, it will just, we would just assign random fidelities to the, to its uh, object X, then like fully random uh, candidates with it, which is a typical baseline in um, in Bayesian optimization and active learning, which is actually a strong uh, baseline in, in active learning. And finally, a reinforcement learning method uh, also used in a, in a multi-fidelity setting. So these are results in a, in a task that is uh, well known in the multi-fidelity literature, it's just um, <clears throat> like hypercubes. In the in the left case, is a it's a two-dimensional hundred by hundred grid, 
And in blue, we're going to see all the time uh, GFRONET. And we see that in this small, um, in these small problems, it does at least as good as as uh, as the as random as and much better than the single fidelity. Let me explain what I'm showing in these figures. It is the y-axis is going to be the the mean of the top k samples at the end of training, and on the x-axis, it is the fraction of the budget used in uh, throughout the iterations of the uh, of the active learning. Okay, let me give a say a few words about the more interesting uh, problems in this. Let me say that in in this problem, these are these are very small problems. You don't need any different to solve this. You can solve it with other with other methods. So this is more for completeness to show to show that it also works here. But we don't expect different to do better than other or much better than other methods here. But still uh, works pretty well, of course. Otherwise, it would be useless. So it is in in in, in more complex structured uh, spaces where where the advantages that I've been talking about in the in the in the presentation actually shine. And for example, these are cases of sampling DNA aptamers and and small proteins, antimicrobial peptides. And what we see here uh, is that well, in the in the DNA, the, the difference with the uh, with random fidelities is not so big, it's still better. You know, even the, the thing here is that small improvements matter a lot. So different is much better, for example, than single fidelity version. So the multi-fidelity different is much better than the single fidelity version. It is much better than, than the PPO, than the reinforcement learning algorithm. And in the case of the antimicrobial peptide task, the difference become much larger. And I want to mention one more thing here, which is what you see more clearly is the mean of the top K um, samples. But we are also plotting in in the markers with the color of the markers the diversity of the um, of the top K candidates. So how similar they are between each other. And what we see is that different manages to all the different methods actually manage to keep high diversity in the samples. Whereas methods like reinforcement learning, they, they become yellow, right? And this yellow is because they get stuck in just one of the one of the modes. Um, this is very similar uh, experiments, just in different tasks with different uh, data. This is uh, small molecules on two different tasks, ionization potential and electron affinity. Sorry for that. Um, and we see the same the same uh, conclusions. The multi fidelity GFLONET outperforms uh, all the methods in the ionization potential. In the on the right, we see that the reinforcement learning method is faster to find top uh, to find a high scores, but without diversity. And diversity is really important uh, in these problems. And eventually, GFLONET uh, also finds high high score uh, samples by keeping the diversity. OK, so with that, I want to say a few words to, to conclude. And, and yeah, I'm running a bit late of time, but hopefully we'll have time for, for a couple of questions. So I talked about the need for accelerating uh, the pace of scientific discovery and how current AI tools, machine learning tools, are not able to truly utilize all the all the resources, methods that are that are available, which is why um, multi-fidelity methods are becoming a, an interesting uh, point of, of study in, in the literature. And I hope I convince you, or at least give you like some intuitions about how why GFLNET can actually help in um, in sampling objects in these high-dimensional spaces with diversity. And how together, combined with multifidelity methods, it can give us it can give us um, uh, advantages over what we have uh, done before. Uh, here are some some references to papers where we, we have presented uh, the topics I have I've talked about in the presentation. And yeah, if you have questions, I'm I'm happy to to discuss. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, all the code of this is uh, open source on, on this repository.
So feel free to, to take a look. Thank you very much, Alex. Let us thank Alex for the nice presentation. Yeah, physically, virtually. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, now let me stop uh, the recording.